Good afternoon and welcome to Talent Talk. It's Tuesday. It's one o'clock. We're live. And well, some of you tune in live and we appreciate that. Most of you get us afterwards on the podcast or on YouTube. Uh, but wherever you find us, don't forget to subscribe. That way you always get the latest episode. You always get to hear from these amazing guests that we have on the show who tell us such incredible stories about what they're working on, what they're doing, what they're thinking about, what they're reading, and how they are, uh, you know, kicking ass out there in the world of business. So, you know, a lot of those fantastic stories we've been able to, to really document and talk about over and over again. In fact, some of them are my uh, first two books, The uh, Power of Company Culture, which came out a few years ago, and then Remote Work, which just came out uh, here this year. So if you like books, uh, I'm sure you know where to find them, but you know, wherever you find your books online, we're there, I'm there, and love to have you check those out and let me know what you think. Um, we are live every Tuesday. And so for those of you that are live, we're checking us out relatively close to the, when we run through this, um, don't forget we live tweet this. So Angela is uh, feverishly typing into Twitter with all of the cool things that our guests say, maybe links to books or profiles or anything important that you know you might've wanted to write down if you are listening and maybe in the car or on the treadmill or whatever it is you're doing right now. So um, hopefully that is a good resource for you. You can also find all of the shows on my website, chrisdyer.com, uh, if you don't know where else to go. So, all right, let's talk about who is on the show today. Uh, we have two great uh, guests. Uh, first is Pamela Hackett, CEO of Proudfoot. Uh, she's right there waving if you're watching live. And uh, then we'll bring in after the commercial break, uh, a buddy of mine known for a long time, a uh, really smart guy, Brian Hinckley from Electrosonic, Global Vice President of Immerse Experiences. Uh, but let's first get to Pamela. She uh, is the CEO of Proudfoot, author of Manage to Engage. She's a keynote speaker, an activist for Heads Up, a global move movement that encourages people to get to be better leaders in all aspects of their lives by connecting with one another and engaging with their environment. So it sounds like she does it all. I think we're going to have a lot to talk about. Pamela, welcome to the show today. Oh, thanks, Chris. I really appreciate to be here and particularly to get that message out around heads up. So thank uh, you for that. If you give me the opportunity, I'll, I'll talk till the cows come home. <laughs> well, that's good. So I know you're in Toronto, but I can also hear as you're speaking, you don't sound like a native Torontoan to me. Right. So tell us about you, where you're originally from, what, what is your passion about, what, what should we know about you? Oh, gosh, I'm from Australia originally. So if you got any of that twang, um, certainly not Canadian. <laughs> but I have been away for 30 years. And wow. remarkably, yeah, remarkably, I joined Proudfoot 35 years ago. I can't believe that now. But um, in Australia and uh, kept with Proudfoot ever since. I think I had a one or two hiatuses for a little bit of time off here and there. Uh, but for the most part, one company, which is really unusual in today's world. Yeah, yeah. And you traded in very different weather. So it sounds like you, you know, you've, you've enjoyed the Toronto weather, which I don't know if I could, but you know, if, if you do, that's great. So <laughs> the extremes that people enjoy, right? So you get I really guess. warm or you get really cold. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I know you wrote a book about engagement and, you know, there's a lot of books about engagement out there. So what really was the impetus or the focus for you to, to bring your, your own stamp to the topic? Yeah, you know, a couple of things. Number one is obviously I lead a company that goes out and does major improvement programs and everyone talks about transformation today. I think the, the misnomer on transformation is that it's this thing that you have to do and I think what people forget is that nothing moves until people move and so really if you want to do transformation you better get your engagement right and if you want to get really good results out of your business you've got to get engagement right. So I think the, the key thing there was all all about how do you get management to recognize that engagement is their thing, uh, that it's not for HR, it's not for, uh, a, you know, a whole department over there. But if you're leading a business, if you're trying to really um, get those great transformations to happen, or if you just want to get your day job done each day, you've really got to bring people along. So the whole impetus originally was, was how can you make engagement something that, that leaders at every level understand is part of their day job? And then 
then the other piece was, boy, we got into a pandemic and isn't engagement the big thing? Um, you know, how do you keep everyone, your, your book with remote work, how do you keep everybody engaged during these really particularly difficult times? You know, I, I kind of laugh sometimes when people talk about engagement. They kind of put it in the framework of almost like this dangling carrots in front of people or uh, I don't know, like putting, it's, I, this is a bad example, but it's like putting cocaine in their Coke or something like, like, how do you like create this like crazy thing like that they would never do on their own? How do you like make them, you know, these super performing rats at the company? And I think that's not it at all, right? I mean, so to, maybe you could really define what is engagement to you? We're not tricking people. We're not, you know, putting, putting uh, stimulants in their, in, their, in their drink to make them go faster, right? What, what, what are we really trying to do when we talk about engagement? Yeah, don't you wish you could just pop a pill for it or something? Um, <laughs> I think that you hit it on the head. You know, it's not about perks. It's not about policies and it's not about ping pong tables. It's about how do you get people to show up at work and really do a great job? How do you get them to really feel like they're a part of the game and they're in the game with you? How do you get them to really own the results that you're trying to achieve as, as a leader? And so it's, it's absolutely not about getting, you know, the HR guys to put in that new policy or that new program. It's all about how you show up every day and how you interact with people and I think that's the misnomer of engagement I think that people completely um, mislabel it as something that you do over there instead of something that's inside and a part of the leader and how you show up at work each day. I remember consulting with a company one time and they really wanted to fix their engagement issues and and I basically gave them they really wanted to just pay people more Right. That was basically what they wanted to do is give more money. And I said, you know, what you could do is just be more transparent. What you could do is just tell people like what's going on and provide more information. And they said, no, we'd rather just pay them more. <laughs> and yeah. And then you want to kind of say, well, I wonder how that worked out for them. Um, it didn't. It didn't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny you talk about pay because I, I talk about fair trade and fair trade means that yes, pay is important, but you just have to make sure that you pay people a reasonable pay right. for the work that they're doing. And if you can't get that right, then you're absolutely right. You're going to have a problem and you need to pay them more. Um, but that's not going to engage them. It may disengage them if you don't pay people the right money, but it's right. certainly not going to engage them. So I, I think you're absolutely right. Well, I think it was Pink, Daniel Pink's work that talked about you got to pay him enough so it's that issue's off the table. But if you put too much pay incentives in there, it actually causes people to be less productive because they're so worried all the time about trying to do all these perfect things to make all this stuff work that they're just not doing good work. They're not stopping to think, they're not stopping to strategize or to brainstorm, right? To think exactly. deeply about things. It's just hurry up and go, 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 because I got to make more money and that doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. So, you know, where, where does your book kind of sit? I mean, is this a, is this a how-to for senior leaders? Is this a how-to for frontline leaders or some combination or where, where do you think all that, who is this really for? I think it's really, um, although I'd like to say it's a combination in that the, the top guys really should understand, obviously, engagement, but it really is aimed at frontline supervisors, team leaders, middle management, and the guys who are struggling every day to try to get there. You know, it, it's, about, it's about really understanding that in today's world, I think that you've got managers who we put people into positions that either um, they, were, they were great at what they were doing, and so we put them in a management job we don't necessarily set them up for success and so that's kind of the old story that we all used to say you know you, you, our supervisors were great at what they did and then we made them supervisors and I don't disagree with it I think it's 100% right but then you add another layer to it and in today's world there's so much coming at managers so much coming at leaders they've got all these balls in the air they've got all the paint you know the plate spinning they've got to be able to get their day job done fix the problems make sure they're looking after their goals and then and you expect them to to kind of get up in the morning and and know how to do all of this so I think the book is really aimed at those guys who are looking for the pragmatic what are the real easy solutions that are me as the supervisor as the manager I can apply it it's not going to cost me any money it's going to cost me my time my effort my commitment to people um, and then what are the real you know things that I should do each day to really make engagement happen and so it's it's 
it, it spells out um, some really simple and pragmatic solutions to be able to do that. Um, uh, if you've got a second, I can, I can give you one really simple tool that sure. I think everybody in business should use today. And we call it 1530. So in, in, the, in the bad old days of early management, when there was all this, um, you know, real, real short interval control over people and, and we wanted that old factory kind of a model, I think that there's a little piece of that that's completely relevant today and that's that you do want supervisors and their teams to be in contact with one another, but you don't want to be the micromanager of yesterday that's looking at the numbers and saying, where are your numbers? What you want to do is, is connect with people in a routine, routine fashion, have a real drumbeat to what you're doing. And so we call this 1530. It's check in once a day. Don't check up, check in. Hi, how's it? How's things going? Is there something stopping you from doing great work today? And what, what can we do to make that better? What can we do to overcome any of the problems that you might be up against, operating problems, challenges that you've got? And if you do that once a day, people start to get that routine. They understand that you're actually not trying to micromanage. You just want to check in and see, see if they're doing okay. Then five, once a week, have a little bit more of a conversation that's about how'd you go this week? How'd the job go? Um, how are you doing with your numbers? Is there something, again, that I can do? I'm the boss. My real job is to make sure I remove any of the barriers that are going to stop you from being successful. And so have that conversation. What can I do to really help you be successful? And then 30 is once a month, have a real conversation about development, about career. Are you really, you know, is, is this headed in the right way for you? Are there things that we can do for the overall job, not just the day job, but for you in your, in your life, in your career? career so if you kind of put that into a rhythm 1530 it's easy to remember it's mm -hmm. just like a performance management system only better because you're not asked to do it annually you're not asked to document things in these horrendous once a year you know situations that are uncomfortable for everyone and instead it's really focused on operating results which is what you really want to talk to people about you want to enable them to do great work which is achieve the results and let's talk about it in a routine fashion day to day so that nobody's frightened they're not scared that the boss is going to come talk to them they're really just able to have a genuine conversation about how things are going and it's easy to remember right one five thirty right, right. Uh, and, and, and I love that. And what's interesting is we've had to take that kind of a program and for remote work for all my organizations that are 100% remote, we had to make little tweaks to that, which is we have to get people to stop meeting one on one because it's terribly inefficient in a remote organization because we don't have those signposts. We don't know when somebody else has met with somebody else. To, we don't see that happening in front of our eyes in the cubicle farm or whatever, right? So we started using the one and the five type meetings as a team, as a group. Hey, everyone, what's going on? How are you doing? What are your obstacles? And they begin to solve problems for each other, collaborate together, realize they have the, some of the same issues as somebody else, right? And they band together to solve these things. And I find it actually takes a lot of pressure off the leader. The leader is facilitating. The leader is not necessarily the one who has to solve all the problems or has to come up with all the solutions, right? And five heads are better than one or two, I guess, in this, in this context. But then in the 30, you get the longer term career planning. Yeah, you do have to kind of meet with maybe somebody or one or two people at a time to have those deeper discussions. And that is probably the one that I see leaders do. Just they run out of time, right? They just, they know they should do it. And it ends up turning into once every six months or once a year, right? And then you have someone who's now do not doesn't see themselves in the organization anymore and they're looking for a new job and you lose a great person right yeah yeah but i mean bingo on all accounts well, you know everything that you talked about is exactly right with the remote world and, and we've seen the same with the companies that, that we're working with i think the key there is to understand the good side the upside of short interval control which is that daily making sure that you're getting the results that you need i think the team meetings are fantastic that is the way to go um, when you know when when you're short on time but for the 30 it is discipline. It is just mm -hmm. accepting the fact that it's the right thing to do and schedule it. And why? Because your attention is going to be better. Your results are going to be better. Your people are going to feel better. And guess what? Your engagement is going to be better. And when you've got great engagement, you usually have great results. Right. Well, I know you have heads up. You have the 1530 and bad hair days. A lot of I love the names and you and I are on the same kind of wavelength. It's got to be a memorable thing, a memorable name in order for it to kind of have stickiness in the organization and people remember what does that thing mean, right? 
Um, it, it, Disney's famous for doing this. Walmart's famous for doing this, having these tribal speak, these certain way we talk that people remember. I think Disney's works well. I think Walmart's is crazy. There's like long acronyms that are 20 letters long. It's easier just to say the thing, but anyways, it works for them. Uh, I, one of the terms that I, I, I wanted to ask you about in the book is called what cheeses people off. What, what, what is that all about? You know, so real, real quick, what cheeses me off was a segment in an Australian, um, it was the equivalent of Saturday Night Live. It was called Hey, Hey, It's Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, Daryl, 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 gosh, his name's popped out of my head. Anyway, um, that was 100 years ago when I was a kid. But um, what, cheeses, what cheeses people off is those things that get in the way of someone doing a great job that they have to put up with day in and day out, mm -hmm. you know, and it's related to that bad hair day and that, and I was talking about the bad hair dryer experience uh, you know you can have all the bells and whistles in the world but if one thing doesn't work right and it doesn't matter how small it is if it's repeated time and time again you're going to lose your guys they're going to just say to you you know what you guys are I'm surrounded by bad cheese I am just surrounded by things that are really putting me off every day and and I don't want to stay so the job of the supervisor the frontline guys is really to search and search out and and get rid of those kind of things that cheese people off and you'll be it'll be remarkable how small some of them are and that you don't realize are getting in the way of people doing great work so you got to get out there and search for them you've got to ask the questions and you've got to help your guys find them but I think you 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 know you you nailed it when you said um it it takes the pressure off you as a leader the more that you can solve the easier it is for your guys to achieve the results the better it is and the less stress it is on you um, so the more that you can get your guys to really find those things that cheese them off and then solve them the better off the business is as well and and this really is if, if you haven't those of you that are listening if you haven't picked up on this this is what engagement really is someone could people want to come to work and they want to do a good job right? 99.99% of them want to do this. And if they can show up and do that, and you've hired them for something they can do, you've hired them for something that they want to do, that are happy to do, then can we get this junk out of their way so they can actually do their job? And they will, that's engagement, right? Then they're like, okay, I like coming here. I like what I'm working for. I like what I'm doing. And when I go do it, I'm not running into a brick wall every five minutes, right? And that's engagement. Yeah. Um, Right. And, and having those little meetings to help people uh, break those things up, problem solve, find solutions is a million times better than a ping pong table or a bean bag or even like, you know, that you bring in lunch every day. I mean, those are nice things. Those are perks. If you want to do that for your company, cool. But like, that's not what's going to really make them engage. It's, it's helping them do a great job. I mean, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's not going to move the dial on results. And at the, at the end of the day, isn't that what we're all there to achieve results, right? Um, right. I think that I think the real key is that simple little phrase, manage to engage. You know, we all talk about leadership and what do you do to be great leaders? Well, the first thing you've got to do is actually figure out how to manage to engage. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's it. You know, if you can get that management, if you can get your management behaviours correct, and, and, and so, you know, connecting with your people, it's a little bit different in every company. You've got the framework and the principles, but how you do it in your company is going to be different than how I do it in my company. Um, but I think it's that manage to engage. And, I, and for me, it's, it, it, it really is. If you want to be a great leader, first learn how to manage to engage and get those behaviors right. Right. Absolutely. And, and, and getting that from the beginning of the small conversations to the big conversations, correct. As we talked about in your one five thirty, is so important. I, I can't tell you how many times I've made the mistake of, wow, you're this amazing employee. You do a fantastic job and you're working part-time. And I'm like, how do I get you full-time? How do we get more out of you more, 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 more. And when you have that deep career conversation with them, you find out I don't want, they don't want to be full-time. They're a part-time there for a reason because they have kids at home and they're the, you know, care, whatever. They have a, a, an entirely different thing happening in their lives, but they're very happy with what they're doing. <laughs> and so you got to get aligned like on their, on their alignment, basically on their path, or else you end up pushing them into something they don't want. Right. Yeah. Uh, or they're a great employee and they want to do more and they want to be on a career track and they want to be a manager in two years. And okay, how do we figure that out? Right. So for everyone, it's different. It's not, um, I, I think managers make the mistake of trying to feed it, treat everybody 
the same um, and, and as in equally, and you can't, right? You can only treat people fairly based on, on what your company can do and what you can do as a leader, but that's going to be different from every single person, right? Yeah, which is why that 30 is really important. So if you're spending a lot of your time in team meetings, you've still got to carve out that individual because you want to have the one-on-one connection with people. And you do, it, it is, it's one person at a time is how you get an engaged workforce and how you connect with people gives you the engagement. There's lots of other things as well. You know, how do you spend your time? What other things do you work on? What colours your day? You know, you're spending it doing a lot of crisis management and admin and reporting or going back to that that great great phrase of heads up um are you are you lifting your nose out of your technology long enough to connect with other people and i think that's the real key is make sure that you do that yeah well uh want to make sure we ask you the most important question before we uh go to commercial break and that is how can people find out more about you and your books and everything that you're doing what's the best way for them to to engage with you so proudfit.com is the company that I lead, a, a global consulting company, operations consulting company. I'd love for you to take a look at what we're doing there and, and get in touch with me. The book, Manage to Engage, is based on 30 odd years of what I've learned um, running major improvement programs with companies around the world. And that's in just about any bookstore and Amazon and, and you name it. So uh, Manage to Engage, I think you can track down there. And then, you know, last resort, you can always look me up, PamelaHackett.com or on LinkedIn, Pamela Hackett it and connect with me there and I'll be happy to have a chat with people. Well, Pamela, thank you so much for being such a great guest today. Hopefully we can have you come back and continue to share more of your fantastic insights. Uh, and we'll be right back after this quick commercial break and bring in my second guest, Brian Hinckley. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me. Imagine buying a newspaper and discovering that the news you're reading is six months old. There isn't much that stays the same for six months. And the same thing goes for background checks. In a time when so much outdated information is being passed around, it's good to know that People G2 offers something different. At People G2, quick sound check? provide today's yep. intelligence. How's that sound? Yesterday's news. Our value-added approach offers Excellent. you a fully FCRA compliant solution that includes up to the minute information. By combining industry-leading technology with old-school human investigation, People G2 is able to give you information that is accurate right now, delivered quickly through our online system or integrated with your HR system. So ask yourself, are you comfortable working with old news or are you ready for a different kind of background check company? Visit PeopleG2.com or call 800-630-2880. That's 800-630-2880 or peopleg2.com. Welcome back to the Talent Talk Radio Show. In case you missed my first guest, Pamela Hackett, you can listen to her interview on our podcast on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Stitcher. You can find it on YouTube or my website, chrisdyer.com or talenttalkradio.com. So there's like literally no excuse not to find us and subscribe and make sure you uh, always get those latest episodes sent to you wherever you feel like ingesting or digesting whatever uh, that content is. All right, let's talk about my next guest, uh, Brian Hinckley, Electrosonic Global Vice President of Immerse Experiences. Uh, don't forget, we are live tweeting right now at PeopleG2 on uh, Twitter and follow that hashtag Talent Talk where we'll put all the best comments, links, profiles, books, whatever we mention, will all be there. But Brian, welcome to the show today. Hello, thanks for having me. It's great Absolutely. to see you. Fantastic. Well, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about you, who you are, kind of where, how you ended up where you are and kind of what you're doing today. Yeah, so uh, I'm the Global Vice President of Electrosonic. Uh, we're an audiovisual uh, B2B systems integration design and support company. Uh, what does that really mean? Uh, we provide audiovisual technology for museums, theme parks, uh, immersive experiences, uh, Silicon Valley companies, uh, Time Square uh, projects in Times Square, uh, and a ton of other Fortune 500 companies that uh, that use technology to really tell stories uh, and involve their audience uh, and their guests. Uh, so, if you've been to a, a theme park in in Orlando, you've probably seen some of our work. We've done work in museums in at the Smithsonian. Washington DC uh, and done projects all over the world. Um, we're a, a 57 year old company. We actually started uh, in London. One of the first technologies that we developed was dimmable ballast for slide projectors. 
to do the original PowerPoint show. So we were able to crossfade and show the, the whole uh, story uh, before we all had laptops and computers and Zooms and stuff like that. So uh, the company has evolved over time. Uh, and now is a, we have about 300 people uh, worldwide, large operations still in London. And then I'm based in Los Angeles with big offices in Orlando and New York and Las Vegas and San Francisco to really support our customers. Um, and I've been with the company 22 years now and a number of different roles, been fortunate enough to do projects all over the world. I lived in uh, Taiwan for a while, did a couple of projects in Japan, Texas, Florida. So it's it's been a, quite a ride and really uh, an experience where I started out as a, a, a entry engineer and project manager and, and worked my way up through the company uh, to where I ended up uh, prior to this current role, I was running our US operations uh, and now work on a global capacity, working with our teams both here in the US and Europe and EMEA to really support our global customers um, and really give that uh, unified experience to, to these key customers that we have. Well, I think, you know, Electric Sonic is part of providing, you know, this technology and solutions that I think are the things that we see inside public spaces that are such an important part of the immersive experience that allow people to maybe understand art better or maybe have a better, uh, a funner time at, a, at an amusement park or whatever that means, right? But, you know, all of a sudden with COVID, all that stuff was up and gone. I think we were talking more about our experiences on Zoom, our experiences and at home or in, in different types of settings. And now as some of that starts to become, come back, I guess maybe talk about how was the business affected by COVID? What did you learn as a leader? And what are you sort of seeing as the as the future now with uh, you know learning right. what we, we have learned during that time? Absolutely. So I like to say that we, we help create memories and memorable experiences. Uh, and with the pandemic, uh, it, it was definitely difficult uh, it, was, it was really tough, uh, obviously, because a lot of our customers shot, uh, shut down and stopped. We had a lot of work in the pipeline, uh, so that, that was good, but uh, the world did stop, and, and it was a challenging year. And I think more than anything, it was really made us rethink uh, how we communicate and work with our teams and our people. Um, fortunately, right before the pandemic, we had upgraded our, our Office 365 company, so we had teams, and we were already starting to use that, but I don't think really understood the power of that or the importance of that. And fortunately, we were able to get up uh, when everything shut down in the pandemic, we we're able to get up to speed quite quickly. Um, but I think that one of the things that, that we learned relatively quickly that was the importance of the communication to our team and keep them up to date uh, and, and making sure that they knew what was going on, but also showing the appreciation for the, their hard work uh, we still, um, we serve some mission critical uh, companies. So we, we didn't fully shut down. We, we have, uh, we physically take product and add value, put it together and add value. So our, our warehouse and factory was open to a limited number of people, but everybody else in the organization started working from home and working remotely. And, and I think that was a, a real eye opener for a lot of our team members and, and leaders like myself to think about, oh, this can be done, this works. And there, there is definitely challenges associated with it, but there's a lot of positives as well. Well, um, I, and I'm wondering how, how are you seeing that strategy maybe playing out in the future for, uh, for remote work? I can recognize a few of your, your books behind you. Uh, and some of my so, favorites. Uh, yeah, so I'm kind of wondering, what are you seeing for the future? Yeah, I think as a company for us, um, you know, we've already had our, number of offices spread around the country and around the world, our customers all over. So we're somewhat working with uh, dealing with remote work and collaborating with teams throughout. But I, I see us as really as a hybrid type organization. I think a lot of people still uh, um, see the value or, or enjoy the ability to work from home and work in different places and that we have the tools uh, in place, but we continue to need to work uh, on, on the the culture, I guess, and and making sure, I think your book really highlights that. And one of the things I really liked in, in, that you talked about in your book was uh, the top-down leadership and really setting the example from the top and managing the time and making sure, I think one of the challenges that we all face working from home is it seems like you never shut off, right? Mm -hmm. So you you have to manage that time and make those, those experience or take that time for yourself. 
I think uh, I just recently I was uh, I was on a walk at lunch and somebody gave me a call. So I, I took that call and they they were like, oh, that's great. You're outside. We can think we can think differently and spend some time on, on our own. And I'm, I'm glad you you pointed that out in your book. So that's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's interesting. It kind of rethink about how we do things. Uh, and I find we can find better ways, right? New ways to to sort of an evolution we can we can sit and, and argue about the old stuff or we can like figure out the cool new stuff and i don't know i'm always interested in the cool new stuff so glad it's yeah, uh, working for you guys definitely but I, I mean there's definitely the issue of the zoom fatigue right and i think mm -hmm. people um it's really important to from the from the leadership and, and from others to remember what it's like to be on these calls all day long and yeah. i think you know uh, our employees probably are are dying to get back to see each other but also um the world's changing right and as a company it's actually we're starting to look at how do we work differently in, in our office footprint reduce some of our costs on a real fixed costs right. on real estate um and, and that that helps um the, you know, the, the work-life balance what, and, as well as the bottom line. So it's a win-win situation. Yeah. And, and you brought up a great example, right? You're out on a walk. You don't have to be on video. You can, right. we can still collaborate and talk in Slack, in Teams, on the phone. We don't have to be as locked into to the video all the time. And right. I, I, think, I think we've sort of, I think people overdid that a little bit during COVID and maybe they were just lonely and, you know, we didn't get to see people. So let's just get everybody on video. Um, and that can be tiring. Tiring. I think seeing it, some of it too, is uh, the whole idea of, I don't think I ever want to go to another Zoom happy hour that the, those kind of like hit their peak and, and right. we're good at the time. But I, I guess some of the, and what's a question that I have for you is what are, what are some of the things that you do or recommend uh, to keep that engagement and kind of the, beyond just a work call? Uh, how do you keep the, those people engaged remotely? Yeah, so we love to uh, first and any meetings that are quick to just keep them quick and to get out of people's way, right? So engagement is also about removing obstacles and removing the junk that cause people to be disengaged. So I feel like dealing with disengagement is just as important as dealing with engagement. Um, so how do we get that stuff out of the way? And then number two is to have like a real check-in. If it's a longer meeting, if you're going to meet with anybody 30 minutes or more, I think I've shared with you the bonding exercise, right? Have people check in. How are you showing up? And then when you're leaving, how is everyone leaving the meeting and making sure senior leaders answer those questions last and you get real insights mm -hmm. to how people are doing that. Maybe you would miss out on in a remote company because you don't see all the body language. You're not right. observing somebody all day. Uh, and you get, I mean, just the other day, someone said, um, well, my, I just found out my, my grandmother passed away. And I'm, it was like, oh, and we were going to have this really big meeting. And we just went, let's stop. We'll have the meeting tomorrow. You need to go, go deal with your family stuff, figure out what if you got to get on a plane, what you got to do. Right. And it was a cool moment of like, that's more important than this dumb meeting we're going to have. Right. right. And that engage, that meant more to that person than that they had to just, I don't know, pretend to be on a meeting and not paying attention. Right. And be upset than anything else we could have done, right? That, that meant more to her than, than a cocktail hour on Friday. Yeah, right? absolutely. <laughs> and I think you make a good point. It's something that I learned and found out. It's not only the group meetings and making those efficient, but I also think it's the one-on-one -on -one connection and making sure people are connecting, uh, the, the manager connecting with their team on a one-on-one -on -one and helping, helping get rid of some of that sludge or some of the speed bumps and friction right. that exists in the workspace, right? Right, and, right. Uh, I've really seen how helpful that can be. So I know as a, as a global company with clients all over the place, uh, do, do you believe Electrosonic has grown closer together or maybe, you know, farther apart? How do, what do you kind of feel like the cultural glue? I've heard from a lot of leaders who have global companies. A lot of them have said they actually feel closer because they did have these more vir virtual remote type meetings, whereas before they had to get on a plane just to go talk to somebody in another country. So do you feel like that there's gotten better or has it gotten worse, you know, as far as the connectedness throughout the global organization? Yeah, I think it's definitely gotten better uh, in a positive way. It, it exactly for that reason is that, you know, there, there's nothing like a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting and breaking bread with a colleague or a customer or something like that. But uh, when, when there are challenging times that we've gone through in the pandemic over the last 15 months or so, 
uh, really being able to come together and have the tools like Teams and Zoom that you can actually see each other and connect. I think we've done a lot better job of um, understanding what everybody's doing in the different locations, but it's also forced us to really rethink and look at some of our procedures and processes because there definitely have been some divergence in the different regional uh, offices and locations, right? E even in North America versus, you know, the difference between the, uh, the West Coast in LA and Orlando, we definitely were doing some things differently, right? And, you know, although 90% of it's the same, that 10% still causes friction and, and uh, disconnection, um, disengagement, as you say, as you say. So I think really what, it, what it's done is made us look at our overall processes as a, a global organization. And we've actually know taking um, called the, the owners and the leadership team saw this as an opportunity and actually invested in a lot of our systems where we've actually updated and added a bunch of automation and streamline you know, relooking at our process and going how can we make this better and how do we make this more consistent which allow people to do exactly what you said spend more time working with the customers working with each other and getting stuff done instead of having to deal with a lot of manual entry and um, antiquated systems and unfortunately we we had not done a great job of updating until right. now well, my hope is that with all this, the new way of working and the new technologies that I suddenly came for the right place at the right time, Teams and Zoom are right. definitely a part of that. For your organization, hopefully that kind of makes the Atlantic shrink a little bit uh, and you're going to be able to be more connected on a global level. And then at some point when we can kind of get back to some semblance of normal, to your point, still go break bread, still go do those things. So those are right. important. Um, but we shouldn't have to just wait for those. It felt like it was like either or, right? You lived in a little world in LA and then you got on a plane and then you were in their world for a little bit and you went home. It kind of should be much more of a hybrid of that, right? And I think that's the way forward. And I think there's something about when you have a, a personal connection with somebody in the real world outside of the, I think that, that seems to be a lot easier to collaborate on a virtual platform. Uh, so you still need that touch point. There's going to be new relationships and new people that you meet, but there's still, it's going to be a hybrid. It's almost like a different kind of hybrid, right? We talked about the hybrid office. It's almost the hybrid reality of relationships. <laughs> yeah, hybrid relationship. I just came up with that. Yeah, right. Wow, the wow. that, there's a new book. Oh, there you go. There we go. There's my book titles. <laughs> Hold on. I've already, I've already copyrighted it. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll write it well, together. How about that? There we go. I like that idea. Perfect. Uh, I know you guys have a lot of niche, you know, technology uh, in your business and you guys are really doing a very specific thing, which I, I find fascinating and really valuable to the, really to what the, to the experience for the world, right? For the general, right. for the average person having a cool way to, to learn something at a museum, right? Or to, to, to be exposed to something they wouldn't otherwise know or right. to learn is really, really important. So with, with all this change, are you guys seeing you know, challenges to growth or challenges in retaining talent or attracting talent, or is it you finding the opposite? Is this like a real uh, gold mine for you? Yeah, no, it's a, it's been challenging on kind of two le levels where we've suffering. Um, you know, I think all companies that we've learned and we haven't been perfect in all our communication and and uh, keeping the team engaged, and we've suffered a little bit of the. I think it's the, the great resignation of 2021, mm -hmm. uh, where we had a few people almost days after day resign, and it it gave us a, a. It was a good punch in the gut to kind of go, wait, what's going? What happened here? And looking back over the last uh, year or so, and saying, look, at the beginning we got we're really good, we were communicating a lot, a lot, and then that falls off over time, right? People, a couple, you know for whatever reason, it's a lot of work to do that, right? Other things, right. there's other priorities, and then you take that for granted. And we realized that we, the pendulum had swung too far. So now it's a matter of how do we come back and make sure that we're touching base with our team members and our, our the, the different teams, as well as the wider organization to make sure everybody's on track um, and look and acknowledge because, you know, it, it's been difficult for everybody, leaders and employees, and to recognize that and then uh, bring that, um, keep that uh, positive attitude and remind everybody what, what the goals are and, and what our focus is and, how, you know, what we do for our customers. Um, so that kind of thing. So we've definitely challenged a little bit of that. And, and it is a, because we are in a niche industry, you, you don't, um, there's not a lot of college programs out there to become, uh, you know, an audiovisual engineer 
something like that. So we found like it's really been important to grow talent. Um, and that's been a big part of Electrosonic and something that I've been proud about is that we've had a, a we call it the starter program, but it's it's an internship program and it's evolved over years. And we, we've uh, we've constantly looked back and, and refined the, the, the program, which I think has been a, a great example of, of what, what we do to to have constant improvement. Um, but really, as a program where we have. Uh, paid interns that come in and they experience every part of the company, which is a little different. So although we might have an audiovisual engineer, he or she will have to spend time in uh, accounting and finance and purchase and receiving and marketing and sales to kind of give them a broad picture of the whole thing and uh, the whole process and all the different facets, facets of a company. And that's become incredibly valuable. Um, and, and if we've gotten some great employees and great long-term employees out of that program. Um, so we're, we're excited and, and starting that went on a little bit of pause with, uh, with the pandemic, but uh, we're wrapping that back up and excited to bring in some uh, new, new talent. Well, if someone was interested in working for your company, maybe a college age person or something, is it, is it more of a creative side that you, you're typically hiring for? Is this more of a technical side? You know, is there somebody else who's sort of coming up with the art, you know, the creative part? And it's, are you guys delivering on their vision or is this about creating the vision as well? Right. No, we're more on the technical side. So we work with a number of creative companies uh, and individuals and owners that are have this vision. And then we bring mm. uh, science, reality and physics in play and uh, uh, make it a reality. So we really we tell we use technology to tell stories and there's tons of different technologies that we use. Uh, from uh, speakers, projectors, uh, large LED displays, and then tying that all together with the control system. Um, and so there's a lot of, um, but the important thing is it's not just here's a here's a TV on the wall to tell your story, right? We, we like to hide the technology and understand um, how to how to create that experience without having uh, the technology really be the, the determining factor. Right. right. It is just it's the tool that creates the experience and tells the story. So it's a lot of you got to interpret the, the design intent and the, the story intent, and the experiential intent. And by putting that and then putting the, the technical twist on how that actually works in reality and and also works day in and day out for sometimes years and years. Well, uh, we're almost out of time, so I want to make sure we ask the two last questions. Uh, the first is, is there a book that you're reading these days that you might suggest our audience check out? Yeah, I really like the uh, the Netflix No Rules Rules book, the Reed Hastings book. I think that's uh, great. They, they have a great example of uh, their culture that's really developed over time and I have a close friend that works at Netflix. So it's always fun. Is this real? Is this really going on? And, and yeah. that's, in, in fact, uh, the truth. And uh you can learn more about Electrosonic at electrosonic.com and you can reach me probably best at LinkedIn, Ryan-K-Hinkley on LinkedIn. So cool. we'll see you around. You, you already answered my my second question, which is oh. how could people find out more about you? So that's awesome. Uh, he, he's on it. Right. Uh, so yeah, make sure you guys check out Electrosonic. Uh, they've done a lot of amazing projects. If you're interested in, in them or in Brian, I'm sure they'll be happy to have you reach out. So. Uh, Brian, thanks uh, so much for being on the show today. And, and yeah, kind of, thanks for having me. Yeah, and thanks for all everything you do for the talent world. It's yeah, awesome. Appreciate it. All right. Well, thanks everyone to listening to today's show. Hopefully you've gained something you can use in your own career in a positive way. Until next time, do what you love and show the world how talented you can be today. All right. Take care. Thanks, Brian. Thank you.